Now, welcome to another Let's Talk Some Andor. This time it'll be episode five, so be warned, spoilers ahead. And we'll once again be taking comments left on my review over on the other channel and kind of responding to them and just having a nice little discussion. And so let's begin with your overall thoughts about episode five. We don't, you know, get to hear your thoughts over on the other channel, unfortunately. Why, why the laugh? Sorry. Episode five, they're continuing with the slow, slow, quick type. Slow, slow, quick? Oh, yeah, yeah I, I mean, so, yeah. yeah. Two episodes of slow, one episode well, of quick, we're I've assuming. I've seen it described by other people as build up, <laughs> set up, action. Yes. Almost as if that is a formula that is tried and true and works. Almost. Almost. I'm curious if that'll change at all going forward or if it's going to be the same format the entire time. But I'm still enjoying Andor. I still think it's it's fresh and interesting to me. The format being so different than what we've been getting I'm just it, kind of episodic, truly episodic. Where yeah, you know, every episode kind of has a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Where they try to do all those three things in one episode, we're kind of getting it spread out to make it more feel like a kind of a movie. All right, so let's begin. All right, we're gonna go with our top comment first. Top comment from Shadow Sentry. I never thought I'd see a scene in Star Wars where a guy is getting berated by his mom while eating some tricks for breakfast. That's unironically one of the most relatable parts of the whole franchise. Ever. Yeah, it sounds like my childhood. Though like, we never got <laughs> tricks. We never got like sugary cereal. We always got like raisin. Well, not raisin bread. Raisin bread is good. sugary? No, we never got like the sugary cereals. Oh. We always got like, you know, bran flakes or something like that, which are still pretty sugary. Yeah. Well, and a fun Almost. fact, StarWars.com now has a recipe so that you could make cereal... Cereal? Cereal? Cereal corn cereal bars. <laughs> They're pretty much Rice Krispies, but you have to find a blue puffed cereal. Oh, Okay. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I mean, the whole episode, the whole series so far has felt like relatable characters. I mean, you had Mon Mothma. I, I mentioned it in my review. It's like a mom, a professional career oriented mom having like a bad day with her husband and her daughter. You know, and you, you ask like how much is she giving up for her career? And of course, we know it's more than just, you know, being a senator for the right. Imperial Senate. She's starting, a, you know, an underground rebellion and all these things. And you ask yourself, how much is this woman going to sacrifice for that? Well, what else I find interesting about the scene he's talking about in particular, for one, I like that Cyril, Cyril, <laughs> Just Cyril, Cyril has like an action figure collection in his room or something. I <laughs> saw them in there. I was like, dang, that's pretty cool. Yeah. But what I thought was interesting is it really gives you even more depth of understanding about why he's going to be going after Andor. Why Andor getting away is now bothering him even more. I mean, we know it cost him his job and everything, but now he's got to deal with his mom on his case, trying to find a new job for him because he wasn't good enough for what he, you know, he was, he just wasn't a, apparently a good son according to her high standards. And this scene helps really drive it into your head what his home life is like and that now Andor has cost him even more. Yeah. Yeah, we get to understand our one of our antagonists pretty well. What's motivating him? <laughs> it's his mother, but not in a good way. <laughs> yeah. Our next comment comes from Jamin Melanson. As a story writer, I appreciate the slow burn. It builds the world and characters and helps you get to know them. Any good story has a slow buildup. Heck, the first hour or more of Fellowship of the Rings is slow. But it works. It sets the foundation for everything else. I find we have got to be too locked into... It's only entertaining if there's action. I think this is a byproduct of our culture, that we're used to getting everything we want when we want it. We've lost the art of being patient and enjoying the journey. Remember when we used to have 20 to 24 episodes of a show in a season? Not every one of those episodes was action-packed, but as long as it told a good story, I didn't mind. Yeah, something like Star Trek The Next Generation comes to mind. Like, It's such a great show, and it's rarely actually very action-packed. It's usually, you know... We find a planet, planet has some kind of weird circumstance going on that we either are going to try to fix or not fix based on mm -hmm. our own, you know, morals and rules of the Federation. Anyway, not to crossbreed here with <laughs> Star Trek, but what? I mean, bringing up Fellowship of the Ring is a great point. I mean, if that book was written today, if Tolkien was, you know, wrote it and tried to bring it in, they'd probably tell him the first, because the first chapter is all about Bilbo's party. You know, <laughs> that's very true. It is. It's it's like thirty or forty pages of a party. They'd probably look at it and be like, "We can't publish this. This is you know, this is, you'd have is to cut out the whole first. Anywhere? Yeah, the whole first chapter is unnecessary. And I, you know, for better or worse, I do think modern audiences with so many options, like 
if you don't like something in the first 10 minutes, you just you're done. You click to something else. Mm -hmm. So I, I unfortunately think part of the problem with that is you do feel like you have to come out of the gate and in five minutes hook somebody. And I'm not saying you don't have to hook somebody early, but, you know, I think there's added pressure knowing that if, if you're not getting to somebody right away, they're just going to mm -hmm. flip to the next show. And with that, we'll flip to the next com <laughs> comment from to Whiterford 110. As someone who wasn't on board with the slow burn concept, this was the episode that convinced me. The 40 minutes went by in a flash and left me wanting more, which hasn't happened with Star Wars in a long time. I also think that Luthen's assistant has given a really underrated performance so far, the best side character and what has been some great acting so far. Yeah, I think she's real. I loved her I, little, I like, distract Cleo? running. Clea? Yeah, running kind of interference, you know, in, the, mm -hmm. in episode four for Mothma and Luthen to go in the back room and discuss. Right, she has a job and she does her job very well, so unfortunately the audiences overlook her. If yeah. she was making mistakes with the job, we'd all know about it, you know? It's, yeah. But she does her job well. I mean, he's like, hey, do you have this? Hey, do you have this? Are you ready with this? And she's like, of course I am. It's my offensive line uh, theory because if football, if you know football, American football for those overseas, you know, the offensive lineman tends to only get acknowledged when he makes a mistake, when he's mm. he's only noticed for screwing up. And I think a lot of times background characters are the same. When they're good, you just kind of, they just, they're there they're and they're there, good yeah. and you don't think about it. But when they're bad, they stick out like a sore thumb. And right. she's an example of like, yeah, no one's really talking about her. But when you really watch her performance, when you really think about what she's doing for the story, she's perfect. I still want to know more of her story. He was very concerned that she has her away bag, her like running away bag oh, yeah, all yeah. set. She's like, yeah, it's already on the ship. What are they together? Are they a couple? <laughs> and I, are they, who knows, could they be siblings? How did they get involved with fighting the rebellion together? I assumed husband wife from the trailers. Or did they both like lose somebody? Yeah, and that brought them together. Long term business partners, brother, like you said, brother, sister. Who knows? Who, who we knows? don't know. We have no idea what their yeah. relationship really We're clearly is. Clearly close right enough now. to trust each other. With, you know, life and death situations. This, yeah. yeah. Bill Cleary says, "I'm really enjoying the character study and look at what the Empire's rule does to the people of the galaxy. I wouldn't want every show to be this, but it's a nice exploration of why the Empire is so hated." Also, the show managed to make one single TIE fighter scary. That is no small accomplishment. No, it's not. Because TIE fighters are kind of one of those things that we don't think of anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just a TIE fighter. Like, we've seen a million of them blown up by X-Wings. So it's not right. a big deal until you're that guy on the ground where one screeches overhead and kind of buzzes the tower, if you will. Pulls a like Top Gun Maverick here. So much that we're definitely getting the impression that they've been practicing and drilling and practicing and drilling over and over and over again. To make sure that their walking is correct, that how they're doing this is correct. They're, they're, they're making sure their posture is correct. Like, we just had this weird assumption, I suppose, that anyone can put on a stormtrooper outfit and walk right well, into a base. And they're actually practicing because they're proving it's not the case. They're worried they're going to get caught. Yeah, unfortunately, other shows have, and the movies to some degree, have given the impression that stormtroopers are just bumbling idiots in a costume. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially Kenobi, I'm sorry to say it, but some of the things you see, the maneuvers they do, where you're just standing in the open trying to fire. Like, a real person would not, like, throw their life away in a, you know, in a firefight like that. And we see it so often. And it's nice to see them, you know, imply that, yeah, the Imperials are real people, have real lives, and, you know, that they would not just stand there and shoot, that they'd have to practice and drill and be ready for an actual fight. Random numbers. To be honest, I'm surprised by how much I'm enjoying this series. You maybe missed a scene with Lieutenant Gorm when he was on a bridge overlooking the landscape and an officer who was staring at it asked him about it being destroyed for mining operation. Moments like that are something I'd never thought I'd see in a Star Wars with two Imperial officers having a chat about the impact they have. This humanizing of bad guys is quite incredible. It is quite incredible. And it it's really so is, yeah. subtly, again, it's subtly and well done. You're, you're just seeing that they're... You know, I've, I've known a lot of people in the military and, you know, again, kind of going back to the previous comment, they have their lives too. They are, are dedicated to a cause and I, I salute them for it. And you, you, they still, you know, outside of that, they want to do things. I, I, I like the scene he mentions here. I also like, or she, I like the scene, you know, the other scene later on when they're kind of, you know, like, I want to see the light show, right? You know, like, yeah, hey, it'd be a, a shame. Yeah, horrible job, yeah. but... Uh... Yeah, I just want to see the light show. I'd be ashamed if, you know, in the, you know... And how smart that officer was. He was always going to let them off duty because he needs there to be a light staff for their job exactly. they're doing. It's... But he kept his persona up the entire time, which I thought was really, really cool. It's a beautifully done scene because it, he's kind of given himself a scapegoat. Like, well, it was the men who, you know, are twisting my arm in a, you know, a way. He's obviously the officer. He doesn't have to listen <laughs> to them. But 
you know, it was his men that he was trying to do a favor for. But, so they're not going to yeah. question him. But at the same time, he's not being obvious that no one's going to suspect no, exactly. he did anything because he was like, well, I was planning on having everybody work. Yeah. You know, they're never going to think he planned any of this. That, oh, he planned for them to be off duty because he really didn't. It's no. Very clever. Very clever. Exactly. Butcher Pete, while the axe forgets is a great line, I just want to say that a surprise from above is never as shocking as one from below. It's probably the singer's greatest line in favor of the Rebel Alliance in Star Wars. It's a perfect embodiment of how the Rebels fight and the lines they are given when they're recruited. Yeah, you never expect... I mean, the Empire isn't thinking anything... I mean, other than a handful of, you know, Deidre, for example, can see the Rebellion kind of, you know, she's worried about it. But no one's expecting... Anything to rise up from below them from the, you know, the scum of the galaxy in their eyes, no doubt. So I, I laugh at Deidre, the self-proclaimed man-hater, who seems to really value her assistant. I'm just she saying. She does, yeah. Well, her assistant seems to be pretty pretty keen, too. He's keen, he's competent, he yeah. works hard. He's, yeah. And yet, she described her character as hating men. But well, that, that can't be the case, right? Yeah, I just, I, I don't want to get into that. Here. Sorry, no, I, no, this, isn't, this isn't the place for that. No, it isn't, but I mean, you do have a point, like... It, it gets frustrating when sometimes the actors will say something and then you watch it and you're like, well, I'm really not getting that from your character. Like, no. I guess if that is what personally motivated you in the role, okay, but I don't know. I She doesn't seem like a man-hater to me. She, You know, she seems like just all for the Empire, Somebody who's right? trying their best in a role that's new to them, too. Yeah, she's yeah, she's trying to prove herself. Whether she's a man or a woman or who she likes or hates is kind of irrelevant to the character. She mm-hmm. finds herself in a situation where she is not loved by everybody because of where she comes from, mm-hmm. and so she's trying to prove herself. Sir Densington, surprising to me, Andor is probably my favorite Star Wars show and probably the best thing Disney Plus has made. It's the first thing to me that feels like a premium streaming show. I like all these scenes fleshing out characters and setting up pieces on the board. It feels like competent people are behind the scenes, and this show is where all the money went. Diego Luna really sells every scene he's in. I agree. It does feel like the most premium show we've got, which, you know, it's not to say all the other shows are bad. Of course, I like Mandalorian and Mandalorian. <laughs> but, <laughs> but when it comes to live action anyway, I mean, season seven of Clone Wars, Rebels, other things I've liked too, but... You know, it is the most premium feeling. I, I, I get what he's saying. It, it actually feels like a lot of time and effort went into writing the script. Not that it was like, well, it's Star Wars, so we can just kind of, you know, fluff it off and, mm-hmm. you know, make whatever. No, this felt like they took a lot of time to make something that's that appeals to non-Star Wars fans as well. That has, you know, a lot of thought put into it. A lot of great characters that kind of merge and come and go. And I don't know, again, really enjoying it. Black Trick says these three episode arcs are fine but they should have released them as three-episode chunks. Would have been better. Obviously, would have been better they... for the flow of the show, I think, so that people yes. would be like, oh, they wouldn't worry so much about the slow because it's really the interlude in the middle of the movies that are generally a yeah, little that, slower. Yeah, that second act kind of yeah. sometimes can be slower. But at the same time, that is a, a lot to watch. It say. would be a lot because they would be all some you know, it would be 45-minute episodes roughly, so yeah, you're looking at a good over a two-hour movie perhaps. But, I mean, they don't do it because they have to draw it out, right? No, no. They have to get they, as many they have to do weeks it. out of it. They're not Netflix. They Hold their subscribers, yeah, yes. Yeah, they're, they're, they're more worried about holding... Well, Netflix should worry about holding their subscribers, too. But they're more worried about drawing out their content because they have less of it overall. And, mm-hmm. you know, they want to keep Star Wars fans subscribed indefinitely and Marvel fans. So, you know, though I agree, three episodes at a time would be nice. And that they made a really, really good decision dropping the first to three all at once. Yeah, they'll just, unfortunately, never going to do that. DK79 says, I thought the scene with the lieutenant getting the men to ask if they could delay their task so they could see the eye event, rather than him ordering them around, thus possibly causing suspicion, was brilliant. They played straight into his hand. Yeah, again, we... We, we did talk we, about that ahead. We I'm did. sorry. Sorry. No, I, I absolutely <laughs> 100% agree with your comment. Absolutely. Sometimes, yeah, we kind of, again, we pick, some comments we pick just... And kind of arrange, you know, because they're topper topper comments, you know, higher rated comments. Other ones we just kind of randomly pick and discuss. So, right, but he, he's absolutely correct. No, he's one thousand percent. And I like that the show didn't go out of your way, like to have him come like wink at the camera or anything. <laughs> the show understood that you are smart enough to understand what he did. Yes, that's see, that's what I like. I like when a show trusts you to like get the subtleness, like mm-hmm, that it doesn't have to go out of its way to explain everything mm-hmm. to you, like you're an idiot. Because at the beginning of the scene, you're wondering, 
is he double crossing them? He's gonna keep all these guys on the base. I mean, yeah. we know Cassian is suspicious of him, but he's like, I'm like, oh my gosh, is he betraying them? Is he gonna like sneaky? I'm keeping all these guys on the base, and then he's like, okay, uh, fine. okay, you okay, guys, you guys get it done the next to, day. I get it. Yeah. Just get it done tomorrow. I was like, oh, it was it was so intelligent. It is. At first, they give you that seed of doubt, and then they're like, no, he's just he's, he's setting he's them smart. up. Smart. Well, he's not smart. setting them up, but he's making it. You know, he's giving himself an alibi essentially. Formerly known as J.A. So we can start calling her Mom Mothma now since she has a kid. I am curious how that will play out down the line. How cautious she will be and or maybe her losing her kid will be the reasoning for her going all in on the rebellion. I don't know. But I can see her daughter playing a huge role in this somehow. Yeah, it's. I, I can see one of a couple options. Either the daughter and the father will leave her at some point because of... Either either they find out she's for the rebellion and they want to protect the daughter, or I mean, there, there's actually a number of different ways it, it could, could go. Very well, be their husband goes into hiding with the daughter yeah. while she continues. Or husband turns in, you know, the mother, and that's why Mon Mothma will eventually not be in the Imperial Senate anymore and takes the daughter. Or something happens to the daughter because, and maybe the husband, who obviously they're kind of estranged, so I don't think she's going to be shedding too many tears for that husband if anything happens to him. Unless that's all part of the act. Uh, she knows she's being watched. It could be, I suppose, but I, I, I get the sense that they're truly. I mean, that the daughter, the daughter seems to be really um, not happy with her mother. So I don't think that is an act at all. It definitely seems to be more for the father. Mm. But either something's going to happen to the daughter, and that's going to change Mon Mothma's. Well, her daughter's at that age too. There's an age well, sure. for girls, especially, and boys too. especially in teenage times, when you really grow apart from your mom. Yeah, I never had that. You'll come. You come back, of course. I think, but yeah. There's a phase, for, and it might just. It might. I think I it might just be know. girls that have a trouble with it because I've that never. We all because me and my sisters all had it uh, roughly around the same time. We're all like, yeah, I'm. I'm done being around mom. I don't want to be around mom. I don't want her to make decisions for me. I'm doing my own thing, and then eventually, like, yeah. Come yeah, back. I, I was always close to my mom. I never had that time where. Well, it's like when when you come drifted. back, you're not really mom and daughter as much anymore. You're friends too. Yeah. But it's the drift away, and then you you come back in a new relationship. Yeah, I think that happens with all you know a lot of kids, with one parent or both. Sure. Mm. Medallion says, "I always thought of Cyril as an antagonist, but not a villain. A villain is an an actually bad slash evil character that must be defeated or overcome. An antagonist doesn't have to be bad or evil, but just counter the hero's mission or purpose." I think the call to Uncle Harlow by Cyril's mother is how he gets into being with the Imperials. Yeah, I think I sometimes use antagonist and villain, not intentionally per se, but interchangeable when they are not. You can be an antagonist without being a villain. A lot of right. a lot of shows have an antagonist, you know, even like a kid's show or, you know, the school bully is more of an antagonist than a quote-unquote villain, you know, that's evil. So, yeah, an antagonist is different than a villain. And so far, Cyril is, I guess, an antagonist. Again, we've really only seen him try to solve a murder <laughs> you know hmm. things went wrong now he's home with his hey, mom he is and the protagonist of his own story he is well a lot of times antagonists <laughs> and villains are the hero of their own story but no he he has done nothing wrong yet he is no he's not a evil person at all no he's just not following the path that we're rooting for <laughs> yeah that's i mean maybe some people are rooting for him at this point but no that's hmm. the thing he we know well we don't know for a hundred percent certainty that he's going to end up on the empire i think we certainly will, but we can't be positive. So he is kind of going to be on the antagonist side of the story. Right. And either the Uncle Harlow is going to get him to be with the Imperials, or Deidre is going to find some information, find out about the Corpos who were fired, and look into him. Yeah. It could be it could be a joint thing, too. He might get into the Empire because of Uncle... Harlow? Uncle Harlow. And then that's how Deidre... I don't know. I, I can't... I, I can't imagine that Deidre and him won't be, you know, buddy cop team here in the near future. But I don't know if they're going to be a team, but she <laughs> okay, needs information team, that she yeah. has. Yeah. But we did see that, you know, she only does have that one officer on her team. So she's probably looking for more help. And then we've got a comment here from Derek Lopez. Truly, I wish the book of Boba Fett in the Obi-Wan Kenobi show were this type of high budget shows. Yep. This type of writing, this type of money poured into them, and they should have been. There's really I know I feel like they rushed those shows just to keep content alive on the platform. 
I feel like Boba Fett was... I still think there might be some sort of conspiracy about Mando Season 3 kind of being postponed, maybe because of Pedro Pascal's schedule. It's it's so strange to get those two Mando episodes. I mean, and they let's call them what they are. They're, they're two Mandalorian episodes in the middle of Book of Boba Fett. They really like are. they started to film the third season or knew they could only film a couple episodes and like let's do Boba Fett in the meantime and we'll throw these two episodes in there. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just it's so strange and you know, now that we're essentially waiting almost 2 years for Mando season 3, so it feels like you your flagship premiere show you wouldn't want to stretch out quite that long. Unless something else went wrong. Only time will tell. Yeah. All right, this is our last comment from Miko01. The references to the wider Star Wars universe are used so sparingly, they mean all the more when they appear. Watching the Seeds of the Rebellion take root has been awesome. Very excited for where the series goes. Yeah, I like it when, you know, even though Gilroy said there's no fan service, I like it when it is subtly sprinkled in, like planet names or a little other small references that mm-hmm. don't immediately like you know rip you out of the story and make you wonder well why why are they mentioning that like they say like Hosni and prime and jakku and kessel a few other things and they're like oh well it makes sense that these might be referenced for one maybe not jakku jakku <laughs> was a strange one because at this time jakku should be pretty irrelevant unless we're going by aftermath the trilogy where palpatine might already be setting up his he could be. little observatory there but of course that would all be in secret Anyway, no, I, I like the little subtle references, and I absolutely love where the show is going so far. All right, well, that is all we got for you this time, so take to the comments below. Tell us what you thought of this episode, and or what we or anyone else here with their comments had to say about it, and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>